Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for this morning. Lord, we thank you for giving us another opportunity to gather in your presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for waking us up this morning, giving us life, health, and strength, reminding us, Lord God, that you have a plan for us today, Lord God, that every single day that you allow us to wake up with your new mercies and new grace, Lord God, that you have a day planned for us, that you have, Lord God, individuals you desire for us to meet, to encounter, Lord God, to help, to bless, to encourage. And Father God, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you, Lord God, for continuing to love us, continue to remind us that, Father God, your plan for our lives is perfect, and you have not forgotten us. You have not forsaken us, Lord God. So, Father, we gather together this morning to just praise your holy name. Lord, we come before your throne, humbling ourselves, asking you to forgive us of every sin, every transgression, and every iniquity. Asking you, Father God, to wash us clean, to keep us, Heavenly Father, when we don't understand about being kept. Lord God, to show us, Heavenly Father, how to love those who have despitefully used us, Lord God, those who have defamed our name, Heavenly Father. When you, Lord God, ask us to love on those who have been our enemies, Lord God, to support them and to help them, Lord God, to encourage them and bless them, Lord God. You bless each of us, Lord God, and call us to be a blessing to others. Lord God, we thank you that today, Heavenly Father, we're going to pray for those who are sick in their bodies. We're going to pray for those who are bereaved, Lord God, and also be a comfort to them. Lord God, we're willing to go where you will send us, and we're willing, Lord God, to say what you will ask us to say. So, Father, use us today as your hands and your feet in this world. Use us today, Lord God, to speak truth and life. Use us today, Father God, to encourage and help and bless someone else, God, that they too may find you, Lord God, to be the answer for their troubles and their issues, their concerns, their stresses, Lord God and their, Lord God, idiosyncrasy. Lord God, that you'll be the one, Heavenly Father, to correct them, to straighten them up from the inside out, to cleanse them, to purify them, and make them whole in your sight. Lord God, we thank you that you've chosen to use us, Lord God, in this time and in this season. And Father, we're asking you to push us, Lord God. Help us to realize our true and full potential. Don't leave us, Heavenly Father, right here where you found us. Lord God, help us to go beyond our expectations go beyond, Lord God, that which we can even think or imagine, Heavenly Father, that we can accomplish more than, Lord God, we've been able to dream up, but all through your Son, Jesus Christ. None of it, but Lord God. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that every single day you reveal yourself to us. Every single day you reveal your plan to us. And every day, Heavenly Father, you show up with love, grace, and mercy to help us to assist us. We praise you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. So we're going to jump straight into the lesson. We've been studying this week about Christ being God, the mighty creator. Amen. Elohim. And I know we've talked about how Elohim is poor. We've talked about Moses being an Egyptian well, Hebrew, who was raised as an Egyptian prince, and how in the midst of him finding out the truth about his identity, he came up with a plan to free his people. And when that plan failed, he ran. And for the next 40 years, he was on the backside of a mountain. But God had a plan for him just like God has a plan for you. And don't get me wrong. Our first attempt at our plan, even if we hear God's plan, our first attempt of it may not be successful. It may be disastrous, just like Moses' plan was. Amen? Because he didn't know how to consult the Lord for the fullness of the plan. He just knew that the Lord told him that he was going to set his people free. But there are some maturing that needs to go on. There's some forgiving that needs to go on. Some healing. Amen. Our focus scripture always long is going to come out of Genesis 1 and 1. Well, chapter 1, actually. And the Lord had me to read the whole chapter because it was powerful and it was needed. Amen. We got a chance to hear and see some things that the Lord was trying to get us to understand. Amen. So, I want us to not just think about it in that sense, but to really go deep. So 
And so I'm going to start reading Genesis 1. And I'm going to start at, let's see, what do I want to start at? Let's start. <laughs> Amen. Let's start at verse 25. Amen. Amen. Now let's start at 24. Then God said, let every, let let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, the cattle of the, the cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the bird of the air, birth of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Hmm. Let's stop right there at verse 28. My God. Amen. So, I'm sorry. It's beautiful that God gave mankind dominion over the beasts of the field, right? Over the birds of the air, the fish in the sea, over the things that creep upon the earth. God had a plan, and we were all a part of the plan. He knew we would be here at this time in this moment. But I want you all to reflect on those. Starting from verse 25 through verse 28. I want us to praise God for his power in creating the heavens and the earth out of absolutely nothing. I want us to take the time today to offer thanks that God has not only created us, but made us in his own image. I want us to confess any tendency to forget that every human life, including our very own, is sacred. Amen. And I want us to take some time today to ask God to renew our sense of wonder and gratitude for the things that he's made. You know, a mighty God could have created this world very differently than what he, he did. It could have been perpetually dark skies, grass that hurts to walk on, Dogs that couldn't be housebroken, and people incapable of love. I never wonder why the world that we take for granted is so often just stunningly beautiful, so pleasant to live in at times. Why the people around us are capable of so much kindness and love. You know, so often we miss life's beauty because we are preoccupied by its flaws. So instead of taking off our shoes and feeling the feathery soft grass beneath our feet, we complain about it growing so fast and that we have to make time to mow it. Rather than enjoying the gregarious woman behind the supermarket counter, we blame her friendly chatter for delaying the checkout line. And what about us? Who stares back at you from the mirror each and every morning? A child of God who is born daily in his image? Or someone whose nose is too big or too small, whose hair is in a perpetual state of rebellion, or whose skin is aged and worn? You see, I challenge you all today 
to look beyond the surface. Look at the beauty of what God has created, all that he has created. He first shaped the world, then he sealed the world. He formed it, then he sealed it. And then he made mankind. God is all about order. Because he didn't just make the heavens and the earth and then just say, let there be water and then with some dry land and then he starts making birds, but the birds hadn't had a tree to land on because he hadn't formed those yet. He did everything in order. And because he did it all in order, we have to know that there was an order to us being here. There's a time for us to get to the place where God is ready for us to fulfill our destiny, our purpose. And the whole thing about it is we have to be in communication, connected to him, in order for us to even know when that time is. We don't want to miss it because we're so busy. We're so busy focusing on the minor things, majoring in the minor things. Amen. So I want you all to think about that today. And today I want you to ask God, the same God who made you, to remake you, make, remake you, but to give you a sense of wonder for his creative power. That same creative power that dwells in each and every one of us. Amen. Yeah. And so as I was meditating on that this morning, the Holy Spirit began to talk to me about family. <laughs> How many of us know that we all have some dysfunction in our families? We love them, but there is some dysfunction that exists there. Amen. The so Lord took me over to Genesis 45. Verse 45 and 5, and then 50 and 20 says, You intended to harm me. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So now, if you ever heard of a family that had to work on forgiveness, Joseph's family was one of those families. Amen? There's always a place that we need to learn about forgiveness to practice forgiveness, to struggle with forgiveness. It is in the family. Our family are the first ones who taught us how to love, how to grow, how to understand, how to learn. But they're also the first ones that hurt us, the first ones we had to forgive, the first ones we had to forgive again and still love. And sometimes it makes you tired just thinking about all that you go through in a family, right? Think about it. And interestingly enough, it's in the context of family where the word forgiveness first shows up in the Bible. So going through scripture with that first family that shows us about forgiveness, it's in the book of Genesis. And there's a young man by the name of Joseph. Remember, he was the 11th of 12 sons, and he was the favorite son of Jacob. And he's most famously known for his coat of elaborate colors that his father had created for him because he was the favorite son. And so young Joseph had several prophetic dreams involving his brothers and his father and his mother. And one day, they would all bow down to him. But rather than 
keep that tidbit of information to himself because he was young and he didn't know any better. He shared it with his already jealous siblings. And when he was 17, his brothers had enough of this rather bratty brother of theirs. So one day when Joseph went out to the fields to check on them, they schemed to throw him in the well. They saw him walking towards them from afar off because of that coat of many colors. And so they decided to shred his fancy coat and tell their father that his favorite son had been killed by a wild animal. Just after they had tossed him in a pit, an Egyptian caravan came passing by. Then they hatched another plan. Rather than leave Joseph in the pit to die, they decided to sell him to the, into slavery and pocket a bit of money in the process. Joseph served as a slave in the house of a high-ranking official named Potiphar. So while there, he was falsely accused of sexual assaulting Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. And we know that we know the story that he excelled in everything that he did. Wherever he went, he instantly was put in command. There was always people to see and recognize that something was different about him. There was favor upon his life. Amen? And because of that same anointing, that anointing that draws people, that anointing that makes you attractive and makes you um, handsome or beautiful to people, is that same anointing that God uses to help us to bless people. Because it is called to draw people to us, that we can share the love of Christ with them. We can share the knowledge of God with them. But for Protestant wife, she just thought it made Joseph just that much more handsome. And when he refused her, she made false claims. Hence, he was thrown into prison. And keeping the story moving, amen? And we thought that we had some bad times and some hard times, right? So during his prison stay, he interpreted some dreams for some fellow inmates. Now, mind you, the prison, the, person, the gentleman over the prison had already put him over all the affairs of the prison. Amen? And so, as Joseph interpreted the dreams of some of the inmates, he asked them if they should ever be, when they would get restored to their position in Pharaoh's house, don't forget about him. Tell Pharaoh about him. And of course, when it came to be, they forgot about him. Or the gentleman that survived forgot about him. But one day, Pharaoh had a disturbing dream, and no one could interpret it. But Pharaoh's cupbearer remembered that there was a gentleman named Joseph in prison who, was, who had interpreted dreams. He had the gift of interpretation. And so he told the Pharaoh about him. So Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Amen? And he predicted seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. The Pharaoh was so enormously grateful with Joseph's God-given wisdom that he appointed him governor of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh himself. During the famine, of all the people who showed up, Joseph's brothers came looking for food for the family. They were terrified when, they, when the governor revealed to, him, to them that he was their long-lost brother. Now, mind you, for seven years of plenty, Joseph had planned for the people, and he built a storehouse where they brought all the extras, and they stored it all away so that they would have food during the seven years of famine. And so when his brother showed up, Joseph said to them, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And there were tears all around. Don't you know they were terrified? Because now he's the governor of Egypt. He has the power to do to them what they did to him. 
But what would Joseph do? What would you do if you were in that situation? This was Joseph's response to the injustice that was inflicted on him by his brothers. He said, and now, do not be distressed, and do not be, aff- do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was, it was the same life that God sent me ahead of you. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. Genesis 45 and 5 and Genesis 50 and 20. Joseph did not say, oh, that's okay, don't worry about it. No, he called the betrayal what it was, evil against him. That resulted in 13 years of slavery. At the same time, he chose to forgive the wrong done to him and allow God's grace to flow through him. He opened the doors of reconciliation and entrusted the matter of justice to God. Amen? How many of us could do that? How many of us need to do that, that we will be free? Not them who did the injustice to us, not those who hurt us, not those who persecuted us, not those who attacked us, but those who did all those things to us, we're going to leave them to God. But we're going to forgive them for us. Amen? And so that's the end of the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Or Bereshit, if you've been with us long enough, you know that the original name for Genesis, the Hebrew name for Genesis is Bereshit. So we close out the epic narrative with a portrait of forgiveness that continues throughout the entire Bible. The word forgive walks out on the stage as a leading character for the entirety of the scriptures. And it began with the words of Jacob, an elderly father making a request to his wronged son. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers and the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God, of your father. When the message came to him, Joseph wept. Genesis 15 and 17. Forgiveness rewrites the ending of your story. Not only does it grieve the pain and make letting go of the past offenses a little bit easier, but it also releases the aroma of hope that helps us reach out to the possibilities for the future. You see, forgiveness is a continuous thing throughout the scriptures, and it all began with a very mixed up family, dysfunctional in every way, right? How appropriate. And I'm sort of glad that gives even me great comfort. And I pray it gives you great comfort. I hope that it helps you to see because our families are the first people that teach us about forgiveness. They're the first ones that we love immensely, but they're the first ones that also hurt us. They're the first ones that confront us. They're the first ones that correct us. They're the first ones who shape how we see the world. Amen? So I want you all to just Think about what was what we went over today. How many ways do you see that Joseph was betrayed? Think about it. They first didn't like him. They isolated him, ostracized him. Then they laughed at him and taunted him when he told them about his dream. Then they hated him. Then they plotted to kill him. They threw him in a pit. Then they pulled him out the pit and sold him into slavery. And from there, it just goes on. Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of rape. He was placed in prison. As he was placed over the prison, he interpreted dreams. And when he interpreted the dream of the cupbearer, the pharaoh, 
He told him that he would be restored and to please don't forget about him when he gets back into Pharaoh's house. The gentleman told him he won't. And when the time came, he forgot about him. And it was time passed. And Joseph kept being faithful. And then Pharaoh had a dream that could not be interpreted. And then the cupbearer remembered him. And then the story changes. But that's several times that he was rejected, he was forsaken, he was lied on, he was mistreated, he was betrayed. We have a lot to forgive in this family. Absolutely. How many of us have a lot to forgive in our families? But see, I want you all to understand that it's paramount that we take the same approach and perspective that that Joseph took. Because what he said was absolutely profound. It was filled with love. And it's the same posture that we need to take. We're going to forgive those who've done us wrong and allow God to deal with the injustice. He called the betrayal a betrayal. He called it evil. Call it what it was. But forgive and let it go. Because in it, we begin to heal from the hurt. But we also have the opportunity to see things through God's sovereignty. So is there someone that you need to forgive today? If so, let them know you forgive them. Ask them to forgive you for you even thinking or feeling some type of way about them. Meditate on that for just a moment as I close us out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for joining us here this morning, for speaking life into us and for reminding us of some things. Help us, Lord God, to ingest that which was said today and taught today, ministered today. Help us, Lord God, to take your word, Lord God, and write it upon the tablets of our hearts that we won't sin against you, that we won't forget, that it will become a part of us. Now, out of the abundance of our mouth, your words will come flowing like rivers of living water. Father, we know that our families are so messy. We hurt each other and we love each other, sometimes all at the same time. But help us to forgive quickly. Help us to allow every situation to make us better and not become bitter. Help us to trust in your sovereignty in every situation. So, Father, we know that you have a plan for our lives, that it is your desire, Lord God, for us to know you as our creator, our Lord. We know that, Father God, you created us for a purpose. But, Lord, we need to seek you for that purpose that we will become complacent. Help us to be children of the royal family that are worthy to carry your name, worthy, Lord God, to be viewed as your own. Help us not to focus on the imperfections in this world, but to look at the beauty, the beauty Lord God, in the total awe of your creation. Lord, how great is your majestic work. And in all the splendor that you created, we thank you. Because we, too, are craftsmanship of your handiwork. We, too, are divinely made, purposed by you, created for greatness through Christ. So today, Lord God, 
we ask you to remake our sense of wonder at your creative power. Help us, Lord God, to tap into the creative power that you place in each of us, that we may begin to speak life and speak it more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Are there any questions, concerns, thoughts? Did God show you some things? Did he remind you of some things, reveal some things to you? This is about time to share in